Hello everyone, my name is Peter Felfer, I'm from the University of Sydney and today I want to show you how to use our Voronoi clustering program. So the Voronoi clustering program came out of the simple thought that clustering analysis should be easy and should be really a one-click process where the algorithms behind um, the the algorithms behind the program actually do all the work for you. And one of the main reasons is that these days we like to daisy chain uh, certain analyses together. So you need a spatial filter where you don't need to start tweaking things or, uh, or optimizing things by hand, but you need something that actually gives you a good answer straight away. And also the parameters that you get should be related to some physical properties of the system. And I'll explain to you in a second how that actually works. And uh, as a demonstration of what the principle behind it is, I've just drawn here a couple of points where this is ran, where this is what what I produce as sort of perceive as random, probably isn't. And this is something where you can see there is a little cluster in there. And Voronoi volume analysis means that um, you actually take the Voronoi cell of each of these dots. In in, in our case, of course, if it's atom prop but data in um, this would be in 3D, and what the uh, oh sorry, what the Voronoi cell is is just the region around your uh, your point or your atom that's closer to that atom than to any um, any other atom, and so this hatched area that's the Voronoi cell um, of our atom, and if you have something like a cluster, you have a different distribution of these cell sizes that because if you can imagine, you've got the Voronoi cell around this cluster here, which would be something like this, or uh, or in here, and this is actually much smaller than the cell size, say, out here, which makes it easy to distinguish between atoms that belong that are belonging to a cluster and atoms that are not belonging to a cluster. And you'll get very, so if you then go and plot a histogram of cell size or cell uh, cell uh, frequency versus cell volume, uh, you get something that looks like this here. There's unfortunately no analytical expression, but there's very good numerical expressions to describe that. Uh, whereas here, you'll of course get something where small size classes are more abandoned. Uh, and then you'll get another one for all the random ones and it gives us the opportunity to actually distinguish between the atoms that are in a cluster and the atoms that are not in a cluster. So, so much for the principle and as you can imagine we've got these histograms so that makes it fairly straightforward to automate the whole process. So if you have clusters in an atom prop data set or and this is one of the most important applications. Say you have a grain boundary and want to create a uh, an object from that grain boundary, or you might have a fin fat and you want to create an object from the gate oxide, something like that. Then it's really a one-click process to get your uh, to get your data filtered. And I'll show you how to use the programs now. So for our example, everything is running in MATLAB. So the programs that are actually contained with the uh, paper are running in MATLAB. And all you need to do is you need to type in Voronoi clustering, and that starts the wizard. And as you can see, the wizard is very simple as well. And as the first step, so you need to actually follow the steps. Um, this is because it's written in MATLAB. MATLAB can't really handle, handle too much interactive stuff. So you just click load post files or load files, and first you will need a dot. POS or .epos if I've implemented that, now just .pos, anyway you can shrink that down and you'll pick your um, uh, you'll pick your .pos file, this is a file with just clustering in it from a super alloy and then you read in the windowing file which is in the .x range format so this is a format that I've come up with and I'm using and it's XML based which means if you program in analysis yourself, any programming language will be able to read it in straight away. In order to produce these files, just go onto my webpage www.peterfelfer.org and you can download an editor that can produce these from um, .pos and .epos files. Uh, open that. 
and it will come up with um, uh, with the individual elements. So here you've got a list of the individual elements, and you can choose which ones you want to test for clustering. And uh, that said, it's not limited to just testing for one element. You can actually combine elements, and I'll but just command clicking on a second element, and I know in this system that I'm looking at, uh, um, there's aluminium and nickel um, precipitates, and I3 uh, N3L precipitates that form in the long run. So if you don't want to look for clustering, we we'll look for clustering of aluminium and nickel together, and that's pretty much it. Next thing is just click perform analysis, and the programs will do the rest for you. The programs are actually parallelized. So one of the first things it will do is try to set up multi-core processing on your computer, which uh, depending on whether you have that set up in your MATLAB or not, will either happen or not happen. So you can see here, it lights up that we're running on four cores. <coughs> and we'll start the processing. I unfortunately got rid of the progress bar because there was some issues with the progress bar on different systems and I wanted to run as smoothly on as many um, systems as possible. Uh, so sorry, it will run a little bit slower than usual because I'm running the recording software which obviously chews up quite a fair bit of processing power. But as you can see, MATLAB is uh, happily working away on um, on four cores and performing the analysis. So after the analysis was performed, which means we're calculating the Voronoi volumes of the atomic distribution, and then we're calculating the Voronoi volumes of an equivalent distribution. So we're taking, um, we're taking a random sample out of the entire data set that contains as many atoms as the um, the cluster test sample that we're doing. So we're randomizing the atomic distribution by random labeling. And the purpose of that is simply so that we have a reference, so that we know what random is, and we can distinguish whether what we are getting is random or non-random. And after it's done this, so you can see the first part of processing is done now. So this would be the processing for calculating the Voronoi volumes of each uh, of the test atoms. And now we'll go on and calculate the Voronoi volumes for each of the uh, um, each of the test atoms that have been spatially randomized by random labeling. And after it's done that, it will actually compare the experimental and the random distribution and determine what the threshold volume is below which we can assume that something is random or non-random and it will also come up with an n-min value which means uh, what's the minimum cluster size to be um, to be a significant cluster and that is necessary because you will in any random distribution you will just have atoms that have a very small Voronoi volume just by pure chance but it's it's a there's a very low chance that these atoms are just randomly next to each other as well. So these atoms can be removed very easily by coming up with an n-min value and both of them automatically processed and I'll, you'll see in a second how. And after that the only thing that's really left is doing either filtering, uh, exporting of the filtered data, of the cluster filtered data, or doing some composition analysis. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail of that. I'll just show you what you can export the data as, because that's probably the most the most important thing in order um, to do something with the filtered data. All right. So now it's the, the analysis is done. You can see the processing is done here, and we can see that the cluster percentage is 5.83 percent, and there's a significance limit of 0.366 percent. So the clustering is um, Clustering is significant. Uh, what do these numbers mean? So the 5.83 is the integral of uh, the experimental minus random curve up to the point where it hits zero. So this curve is an approximation. Is an approximation of the distribution of the clustered atoms. 
and therefore we integrate the amount of clustered atoms up to the point to the point up here and this is also the um the relevant figure for the Kolmogorov's mean of test for uh um for for random for spatial for randomness and this is the the significance limit so you'll see in the paper um the mathematics are actually dealt with in the paper but the Kolmogorov's mean of test tells us if this integral here is more than 0.366% of all atoms, uh, contains more than 0.366% of all atoms, then the clustering is non-random, and that is actually um, the case. And the cluster cutoff is here. Um, the last point, the, the last histogram point that it would actually apply to is point, uh, 0.16, so it's about here, because the, the next, um, the zero crossing is here. But anyway, it will actually uh, it will actually do that on a per atom basis up to here. And then we have the cluster size distribution, which is what we need to determine the uh, minimum cluster size that's relevant. And I'll just zoom in because, of course, we've got relatively large clusters with up to 900 atoms in them. And all the relevant stuff for, for that is going on at very small cluster sizes. So it's going on down here. And here we've got the, the distribution of the cluster sizes in the actual data. And the dashed line is in the randomized data. And you can see in the randomized data, you can get randomized clusters up to sizes up to, say, 30 or 40. But they're very rare. Most of the cluster, most of the randomized, uh, random clusters are very, very small. And that's where it actually matches up with the actual cluster size distribution. And here the cutoff point is where um, the 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 amount of randomized clusters is less than half of the amount um, of the uh, of the the clusters in the non-randomized data, which means that if I have a cluster in my data, it's more likely to be an actual cluster than a random cluster. So that that's what it really makes for the cutoff point. And that is the entire analysis. The only thing we have to do now is export the data. So you can see that here. Actually, if you have a reason to to change these values, you can change the values. And you can export the data with the changed values as well. There's no... Uh, you're not forced to stick with these values, even though if you do cluster analysis, I would recommend you stick to these values. If you use it as a spatial filter for uh, for object creation, uh, feel free to tweak it if it doesn't look exactly how I want it to look. Um, anyway, but for now we'll stick with these values. Um, the things that you can export are um, a cluster test report, which just contains all the information that was used to determine the, the clustering, uh, which is important if you write a paper about it, of course. Clusters test items, so it import it exports the clusters. And only, in our case, the aluminium and the nickel atoms. So only the atoms that you've tested for. The next thing is the convex hulls. So it creates a convex hull, which is a mesh around each cluster. And since most clusters are actually convex, you can use these convex hulls to, for example, calculate proximity histograms, um, volumes, or other things um, from your clusters. Or clusters all atoms means it takes all of the atoms that are within the convex hulls of the clusters. If your clusters are not convex, of course, um, this is a bit of an issue, so you can't really use that then. Um, and as, uh, as a last thing, you can export the cluster locations. What that means is that for each cluster, the centroid is calculated, and we export the positions of these cluster centroids. So this gives you the opportunity to calculate statistics about the cluster distribution. So if there's more in one direction or the other. And it can also be used for, uh, for reconstruction purposes. So you can guide your reconstruction if you have a metal where you have small precipitates. Usually the precipitation is, the distribution of the precipitates is, um, is isotropic. So you can go into the cluster locations and have a look if the distribution of your clusters is isotropic or if they're further apart in X, Y than in Z, then you know your reconstruction is incorrect. Anyway, for now, we'll just go with the uh, cluster test atoms. 
and we'll export that. We'll put it into here, save as bulk clusters, save. And just to show you what the result looks like, this is I'm using 3D Pick. So this is Daniel Haley's uh, Atom Pro Visualization Program. It's a very very handy program. Um, and I'll just go recent places. So here, that's the entire data set. Maybe we'll just delete the iron sampler so you can see what the entire data set looks like. It's a crop data set because there is a precipitate on one side. So this is actually precipitation near an interface. Sorry, let me just go and change the uh, the camera to orthogonal. I think that's a bit easier to see things then. Anyway, so this is um, this is the crop. This is the data that we've done uh, the volume that we've done the analysis in. And let's just open the filtered version. So remove the iron sample as well. And enable this, and you can see that we get uh, we get very good cluster sampling. Um, the one up here is just a, an artifact from the cropping, but yeah. So that's um, that's it for the clustering analysis using Vor using Voronoi cells. Very quick, uh, very simple to understand. The only thing it needs is a little bit of processing power and a little bit of memory on your computer, but um, these days, even my my laptop, I'm running this on a 15-inch MacBook Pro um, with uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM. And if you go and look into the activity monitor, um, how much memory we're using, uh, MATLAB's actually only using 1.3 gigabytes. So forget about that. So. Uh, most you'll get away with pretty much uh, any computer. All right. So thank you for for watching this tutorial. I hope you're gonna find my programs very useful, and you're gonna be using them for cluster analysis and uh, analysis of other objects. Uh, will be which will be a separate tutorial.